Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Turning to a New Dimension in Cell Culture for Cancer Research, presented by Carla Mincarlitz, Postdoctoral Research Fellow at Pharmacin Northwest University. I am Alexis Cross of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labberts and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information on our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com. Now, let's get started. Before I begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the answer question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Dr. Carla Mikalitz. Dr. Kalitz completed her PhD in pharmaceutics in 2017. Her thesis focused on the establishment of three-dimensional cell culture models for drug biotransformation and toxicity studies. She was awarded the South African National Research Foundation Innovation Doctoral Scholarship and Travel Award in 2016 and 2017. With this award, she was able to spend six months at the University of Southern Denmark in Odense, Denmark, learning the art of three-dimensional spheroid culturing. Since 2014, she has published five first author publications in international peer-reviewed journals. Dr. Kalitz is currently employed in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the NWU as a postdoctoral research fellow, focusing on the development of three-dimensional cell culture models and platforms for cancer research, biotransformation, and toxicity screening of preclinical lead compounds or traditional herbal medicine. For a complete biography on Dr. Kalitz, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Kalitz, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, good morning. My name is Dr. Karl Mikonitz. And before I start, I would like to thank GIBGO and Thermo Fisher Scientific, especially Chelsea, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about one of my greatest passions in life, three-dimensional cell culturing, specifically swear word cultures, and the dimension shift in cancer research. Uh, just a bit of geographical and general information for you, those of you who do not know where the Northwest University is. We are one of the biggest universities in South Africa, catering for approximately 80,000 students with three campuses and eight faculties. I am situated on the Potchefstroom campus in the Center of Excellence for Pharmaceutical Sciences within the Faculty of Health Sciences, all in a little town called Potchefstroom. I am currently a postdoctoral fellow responsible, together with my fellow postdoc, Dr. Clarissa Villersch, for the establishment of new swearwood cancer models, working under the guidance of our wonderful hosts, Dr. Krishna Host and Professor Sias Haman. And here at the Northwest University, we have started a paradigm shift in terms of cellular dimension in an attempt to better understand and answer cancer as a disease and the treatment thereof. It is concerning to know that cancer results in more deaths than AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. Cancer statistics indicate an estimated 8.2 million annual deaths worldwide with 46 of these cancer deaths attributed to lung, liver, stomach, or bowel cancer. Understanding, these, uh, understanding this disease and finding the best treatment is of utmost importance. Currently, pharmaceutical research and development is spending billions of dollars to get new, more effective drugs on the market. This is a very costly and timely business when we look at the high incidence of drug attrition rates the costliest in terms of the lives dependent on these drug discoveries. 
High drug attrition rates are mostly attributed to the fact that a gap exists between our current in vitro and in vivo models and ultimately humans. This development, uh, thus development and the use of appropriate in vitro and in vivo cancer models is highly desirable. The current gold standard in in vitro and in vivo preclinical cancer drug treatment screening remain primary cell cultures and cancer cell lines grown on static, flat, two-dimensional surfaces and animal models that mainly include rodents such as hamsters, rice, oh, sorry, rats and mice. Two-dimensional cell cultures offer various advantages in that culturing conditions are highly controlled with a high degree of homogeneity and reproducibility, allowing for the discovery of molecular mechanisms. The system has also contributed significantly to our knowledge of tumor biology while stimulating cancer research in terms of drug discovery and development. Furthermore, the low cost and the simplicity of this model also attributes to its popularity. Unfortunately, the system also comes with its limitations, including phenotypic and genotypic adaptations to in vitro conditions, as well as the accumulation of mutations. Furthermore, the system is limited in terms of cytotoxicity assays and partly accounts for the high rate of drug failure. And being an isolated, homogenous population of cells removes these cells from the true tumor microenvironment with a lack of cell-cell communication, cell matrix interactions, and also a lack of tissue-specific architecture. On the other hand, animal models have been used for many years in cancer research and drug discovery and remains a prerequisite in preclinical drug screening according to the FDA. Cancer mouse models have revolutionized our ability to study gene expression and protein function and more closely resemble human physiology. However, these models tend to be expensive and time-consuming. Furthermore, animal models too frequently fail to reflect the true human tumor biology. These models are in some instances immunocompromised and present with sex and species differences. And not all cancer cell types have a suitable animal model yet. Most importantly, they come with ethical and moral considerations. So to bridge the gap between this shortcomings of current in vitro and in vivo models, we are turning to a new dimension in cell culturing. In order to understand why, we have to look at the human body. Organs and tumors boast a unique three-dimensional cellular architecture with established communication networks that allow cells to communicate with each other as well as with the extracellular matrix. Yet, two-dimensional cell cultures lack this cell-cell communication, the cell matrix interaction, and also tissue-specific architecture. And animal models fail to reflect the true human tumor biology. So how do we bridge this gap? It is true that the best model for man is man. However, it is not ethically allowed to test on humans without some form of prior toxicological ev evaluation of a new lead compound. With the establishment of three-dimensional cell culture systems, it was found that three-dimensional cell culturing offers a better correlation to this in vivo situation. As three-dimensional models offer a more natural shape, geometry, and morphology of cells with established cell-to-cell -cell communication, regulatory mechanisms, and signaling networks. Also, 3D constructs tend to adopt a tissue-like structure, making them more physiologically relevant. To fully appreciate the statement, we have to look at some very important and distinct differences between two- and three-dimensional cell culturing. The table here shows some of the major differences between these two models. I'm briefly going to go through a few of them. One of the most striking differences between 2D and 3D culturing is the culturing time. 2D cultures have a limited working window, usually days to weeks, while some 3D systems have working windows from weeks to months. Due to the unnatural two-dimensional microenvironment of cells in 2D, important metabolism and biochemical features are altered that has an influence on the pharmacological drug responses. 
Also, due to the geometrical and morphological differences that influence the cell's cytoskeleton, gene, and protein expression, responsible for cellular responses are influenced. In three-dimensional cultures, cells find themselves in a more natural, geometrical, and morphological shape, resulting in some instances in the formation of in vivo-like tissue structures that provides more clinical relevant data, more representative of the in vivo condition, and comparable to animal studies. In cancer research, the differences in the cell psychokinetics and proliferation rates of these two models are of major concern. The cell cycle is a series of events that results in the duplication and division of cells. The components responsible for cell growth and division also influences cell differentiation. Controlling the cell cycle is of utmost importance as cancer, in many instances, is attributed to the dysregulation of this cell cycle. Within the human body, most cells find themselves within the G0G1 phase, thus with some cells actively replicating, but most cells no longer dividing, but carrying out specialized functions. Cells within two-dimensional cultures find themselves within a continuous growth phase and are actively replicating due to the need for subsequent subculturing upon reaching confluency. Whereas cell aggregates within 3D con uh, cell cultures find themselves in various stages of the cell cycle. It is these critical differences that culminate into discrepancies towards drug responses, and it also suggests that 3D models might be more apt at providing insight as to how cancer and specific organ systems will react to lead anti-cancer compounds. So various three-dimensional culture systems are available, and it should be stressed that not one method is superior to the other and that your research question available resource, and available resources will determine which system you will employ. Three-dimensional systems can be broadly classified into static and dynamic or irrigated systems. Static systems, as the classification suggests, is static non-moving systems. These include, but are not limited to hanging drop cultures, force floating devices, micromolding and printing devices, galactosylated substrates, 3D scaffolds, and primary dishes while dynamic or irrigated systems suggest a system that has moving parts. These systems usually include spinner flasks, microfluidic devices, uh, microreactors, uh, or rotating bioreactors, as you can see in this quick video of 19 seconds. The field of three-dimensional cell culturing is very broad indeed, and it will most probably take more than one webinar to cover all of them. And for this reason, I will focus only on three-dimensional multicellular spheroid culture. A spheroid is defined as a spherical symmetrical aggregate of cells analogous to tissue. Spheroids are seen as heterogeneous aggregates, the cells that are proliferating or cohesant and retain the 3D architecture with the capability to re-establish the tissue-specific functions. Multicellular spheroids are also capable of mimicking in vivo processes such as embryogenesis, morphogenesis, and organogenesis. Three-dimensional spheroid models possess several in vivo-like features of tumors, including cell-to-cell -cell interactions, hypoxia, drug penetration response and resistance, as well as the production and or deposition of extracellular matrix. Various cell lines are capable of forming multicellular spheroid structures, exhibiting in vivo-like physiological conditions. For instance, cardiomyocyte spheroids that beat with heartbeat-like rhythms, hepatocyte spheroids that perform liver-like functions with liver-like structures, and even brain organoids. 
Researchers are now also considering the use of steroids to build biofabricated 3D functional living micro tissues and organ constructs by means of organ printing that will further enhance the field of tissue engineering. Steroids can be produced by various means. As I said, um, spinner flask, self aggregation, hanging drop cultures, and rotating bioreactors. In our laboratory, we employ the Salvivo BOM system, that is a clinostat based system using rotating bioreactors. Now, for those of you who do not know, a clinostat is a rotating device that has been around since the 1920s that was designed to allow a plant to experience equal amounts of gravitational pull over 360 degrees. In this way, there is little to no gravitational pull on the plant, allowing the plant to overcome instances of positive phototropism or geotropism. The same principles account for cells grown in a clinostat bioreactor, in that the gravitational pull is lessened on the cells. It should be noted that the gravitational forces cannot be overcome in a lab laboratory environment. So when researchers usually mention a microgravity bioreactor, they are actually referring to a clinostat-based bioreactor. The Salviva BOM system is a next-generation clinostat-based system that comes with a driving unit, an uh, environmental control, a wireless control system with one of the most user-friendly interfaces. And Surprisingly, the Northwest University is also a training site for this Salviva BOM system. So spirits and organoids for use with this system can be created by various means. So you can use agrobel plates from stem cell technologies or the spherical plate 5D from Kuchel-Myers, microcarrier uh, micro beads, hydrogels like sodium alginate, matrigel or Q-gel, and self-aggregation from single-cell suspensions. These methods and products are probably not the only products that you can use to produce steroids, so you need to establish a method that suits your need, that is based on your cell type, your research question, and your available resources. So, in our labs, we prefer to work with the agarol plates and sodium alginate. The rotating bioreactors developed by Salvivo are fixed volume bioreactors that come already assembled. These bioreactors have a cell chamber with two openings that allow for sampling and medium exchange, and a water chamber with a wick to generate humidity. The cell chamber and water chamber is separated by a 0.2 micron membrane, and the gas exchange labyrinth on the water chamber allows for optimum oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. Because this is a closed system, instances of contamination and infection within cultures are also kept to a minimum. What I would also like to say about the fixed volume of the bioreactors is that this allows us specifically in toxicological or cytotoxicity studies to uh, uh, administer dosage uh, according to the weight and according to a fixed volume. So in different systems, usually the volumes differ, and it, it makes dosing very hard. An agarol plate, again, allows us to generate up to 1,200 size-controlled spheroids per well within 24 hours after seeding. This gives us ample biological assay sample material, and after spheroid formation in the agarols, spheroids are transferred to the rotating bioreactors which is then placed on the BUM rotating system. Swearers produced in this way can have a physiological functionality for a period of 42 days, with the swearers reaching a metabolic equilibrium around 21 days. This means that your experimental design is now not limited to five or seven days, as with traditional two-dimensional cultures, but now you can conduct experiments over a 21-day period. So let's look at how you would approach this establishment of a new multicellular steroid model. Currently, we are 
trying very hard to establish lung cancer steroids, which we hope to publish by the end of this year. So this was the steps we took in establishing it. The first order of business for us was to get to know our cell line, as well as the organ of origin and the attributes of the specific cancer. And this allowed us to determine what we would be characterizing during the establishment of this model. For instance, we asked questions, are we interested in the expression of certain proteins, genes, or transporters? You can ask yourself also what the native organ looked like and what kind of functionalities it performs. So that during characterization, you can then determine if it resembles the native physiological, physiological functionality and anatomy. This is probably one of the most important steps because if you don't understand your cell or what your, what your question is, you do not know what to look for and how to go about the next steps. Then you will continue to determine growth characteristics. Oh, no, no, sorry. <laughs> First, you have to create the steroid model using your desired technique, and then you will continue to determine, to determine the growth characteristics such as vi and viability and functionality of your cell line in both two-dimensional cultures as well as your, as well as your three-dimensional steroid cultures. And finally, you will attempt to validate your model by means of well-published and established anti-cancer model compounds. So, after familiarizing yourself with all the literature available regarding your cell line and the type of cancer that you are investigating, you can begin to develop your steroid model. This step will require some optimization and patience as different cell types will behave differently in both the agarol and sodium alginate as well as as your choice of method to create your spheroids. So seeding densities, time within the agarols, agarol size, the stiffness of the sodium alginate gel, the cell shape, the culture medium requirements of the cells, all of this will come into play as all of the, these attributes will influence the form, formation of spheroids and its microenvironment. So as a rule, in our laboratory, when we start off, we start off by seeding 1,000 cells per microwell in each agarivel. We then leave the cells to form swirls for a 24-hour period and then remove the, them from the agarivels and place them within the bioreactors. And then we monitor the rotation speed according to the growth rate and the size of the swirls. This is also a very important step with our system. However, we have noticed that not all cell lines adhere to these conditions as you can see in the images displayed here. In images one, two, and three, we have a cell line that behaved perfectly and conformed to all the set conditions, making the most beautiful, perfect steroids we have ever seen. And then we went to the next cell line, which you can see in image four, five, and six. This gave us somewhat of a headache. After we seeded the cells, we came to the lab the next morning very excited, and upon inspection of the agarivals, it appeared that the fluids formed were not usable. However, being the, the ever optimistic one, I said to Clarissa, let's remove them from the wells. And indeed, we had perfect steroids. And finally, images 7, 8, and 9 show the cell line that did not want to conform to, to the set conditions and required 48 hours within the agarivals before steroid formation. Even then, the steroids are not as we would want them. However, as you can see in image 10 and 11, after being placed within the rotating bioreactors, these steroids formed beautiful spherical aggregates within six days. So in our laboratories, all these models could be maintained for a period of 30 days after steroid formation by careful speed adjustment and regular medium changes. So, oh, we have a good steroid model, and now we have to characterize this model so that we know what this model can and cannot do. We do our characterization in 2D as well as in 3D so that we can determine if indeed growing cells in spherical aggregates affect the functionality or not. Characterization involves many steps 
depending on the model that you are developing. And you may even find that in your lab, you can probably add something to this or even do it in different ways. Once again, and this is very important, resources and research question will determine what will be most important in each instance. In our laboratory, we first determine the growth characteristics of the two, of the two models. In the 3D model, this is usually done by taking daily photomicrographs of your spheroids and conducting planimetric measurements of the spheroids using software like ImageJ, which is freeware. In the 2D model, growth characteristics can be determined by means of cell counting or extelligence. We then determine the protein content of both the 3D and the 2D models on a daily basis. In our laboratories, we use the Bradford assay. It's, it's quite easy to come by and not too expensive. But once again, there are many other protein determination kits available. So why do we do it? Once you start your growth characteristics, you will notice that there are striking differences in the doubling time of 2D and 3D cultures. In the Hep G2 C3A spheroids, um, we notice a fall in the growth rate in the 3D cultures after 21 days. Also, to circumvent some of the difficulties associated with performing the quantitative cytotoxicity studies in 3D cultures, such as the inability to count cells within spheroids and also the particulate nature thereof, we attempt to make the data relatable to in vivo animal studies by determining the amount of protein present. So during characterization, we take photomicrographs daily, and then we measure the circumference of the shadow area of the spheroid um, by using image J. And then after that, we determine the protein content using the Bradford assay. And then by plotting the planimetric data as a function of the protein content, we find that there is a clear correlation. So this allows us then to set up a lookup table to allow you to only perform the non-destructive planimetric measurements in your following studies and then simply relate them to the protein content. Such a lookup table will differ obviously for each cell line as each cell line will probably produce different sized spheroids and with different protein contents. So it should be individually set up for each new spheroid model. So, to make the life even more easier, we then make our 2D data more relatable to our 3D data by applying the same principle. Just with 2D data, you can actually count your cells. So, once again, we take photomicrographs after seeding cells in 96 well plates, and then we count them by means of image J. After that, we perform the protein content determination, and then we can relate the number of cells to the amount of protein, and we can also set up a lookup table. In both instances, these calculations allows us to administer dosages during our experiments and preclinical drug trials in terms of milligram per kilogram that is more relatable to your in vivo studies. We also do daily viability checks. This is usually uh, the less fun part of the study, but by measuring the intracellular ATP content and the extracellular adenine and adenolite kinase and lactate dehydrogenase release, we can determine the viability. So, and this is also can also be determined by different means, and various kits are available. So you will just have to to figure out what suits you the best. So. The intracellular ATP levels and the adenylide kinase levels offer us a valuable insight into the viability of our system at a time. It is very important to, to determine the viability of your system as this will influence your working window and the results you can expect. Here we have some images. Images C and E respectively show results from the intracellular ATP levels and adenylite kinase levels of 2D cultures over four days. And image D and F shows the intracellular ATP levels and adenylite kinase release of 3D cultures over a 21 day period. From this data, we could, most, uh, uh, we could determine that the best time to work with 2D cultures to get the most accurate results would be from day one to three, whereas 
with the 3D cultures, we only start to work from day 17 or 21 up until day 42. Determining functionality will depend on the system and the research question, and the time point should be set up accordingly. Samples for proteomics are collected as often as possible at various time points, and then you can also do confocal imaging, histochemistry, and transmission electron microscopy, um, as this provides insights into any structural differences between the two systems over time and should be conducted at various time points. Some of our most exciting discoveries in terms of the differences between 2D and 3D systems will most probably come from the functionality and proteomic as well as the imaging data. Observing the Hep 2 c 3 a liver spheroids and traditional 2D cultures after four days in culture using a transmission electron microscope found that both the cultures presented with organelles normally found in eukaryotic cells like mitochondria, nuclei, endoplasmic reticulum, and so forth. However, spheroids exhibited additional features not often seen in 2D cultures, such as the formation of liver-like structures in the form of biochemically-like structures, glycogen granules, and sinusoidal-like channels packed with long villi. Other functionality tests not shown here indicate that 3D cultures produce more urea and bile compared to their 2D counterparts after 21 days. Also, the proteomic data offered wonderful insights, such as the nuclear rearrangement, cytoskeletal rearrangement, the reduced protein oxidation, and the production of hemoglobin. For more insights into some of our established spirit systems and the differences between 2D and 3D culture, please see the list of publications at the end of this presentation. I hope you found this webinar insightful and that you are all now ready to make this dimension shift by realizing that three-dimensional spheroids offer an exciting model to investigate in vivo-like functionality where cells are grown in conditions that are not drastically different to those seen in real tissue as in contrast to the classical two-dimensional cell culturing. For more insights to some of the products mentioned and the cell vivo bomb system, please view the list of websites at the end. I hope you will also join our following webinar where my colleagues at Dr. Clarissa Villers will discuss the validation and the application of our new spheroid models. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Khalid, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the answer question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, name the most inexpensive technique to, the, to develop spheroid fear, culture. Uh, for us, that will be uh, sodium alginate. That is probably the most inexpensive technique to develop spirit cultures with. Our next question is, why do you say the 3D spheroid model is more relevant, specifically in regards to your comments about the cell cycle? Um, 2D cells uh, are usually in a, in a continuous growth phase whereas 3D cells are in both a continuous growth phase as well as in a non-proliferating non yet metabolically active state. And this is more like the in vivo situation. And for that reason, we, we use them in, in regards to the cell cycle. What is the reproducibility between separate experiments of these spheroids created in the clinostat-based system? especially between different bioreactors? Um, it's actually quite, quite reproducible. When we set up our protein table, I think the experiments were done about 800 times. Yes, and that is how we got our um, tables up like that. So it's quite, quite reproducible. 
Um, I've done these experiments in, in our labs in South Africa, and I've also done them in, our, in the labs at the, um, in, in Udense, uh, Denmark, and I've always achieved the same results. I've never really had something that deviated much from our, our known tables. Dr. Khalifa, our next question. Could you please repeat what were images 10 and 11? Images 10 and 11. On slide. Oh, images 10 and 11. Those were our, um, I just need to get to it. This is one of our star lines that we, um, we struggled to make spheroids with. When we removed them from the agrivolt, they were, as you can see on image nine, they are not really that nice looking. So when we put them into the bioreactors after six days, they actually formed beautiful round spherical aggregates. And um, that, is, that is what images 10 and 11 is. Just to show you that after a while, the system, the bioreactor system will help your cells form these spheroids. How do you know which cell lines can be established as 3D spheroid models? Well, theoretically, any, any adherent cell line should be able to form a spheroid with any of the methods proposed. However, um, it's important to study their known characteristics, and each line will need to be optimized, and adaptations to the me methods should be made. Our next question, why do you only start to use the spheroid cultures after 21 days? Uh, this is a very interesting question. It's a very important question. So for this, I'm going to go back to slide 27. And on slide 27, in figures D and F, we notice that from day 1 to 13, that, is a, that there is a corresponding um, increase, um, that, that, that the 3D, <laughs> sorry, the 3D cultures corresponds well to the 2D cultures in terms of the initial increase in both the ATP and the adenyl kinase. So I'm just going to say AK from now on. This is normal due to the active proliferating cells as well as the growing cell number. However, between day 15 and 18, we see a transition in the, in the 3D cultures, um, which we don't get fully understood. So after day, uh, after day 18, when the cells, according to the growth curve, which we do not show here, um, reaches uh, uh, has a reduction in doubling time, there's an increase in the ATP and a drastic decrease in the AK. So this system is not actively proliferating. However, the ATP levels indicate that they are still very much metabolically active, almost like the in vivo situation. So we work with the steroids at this point as it offers us a more stable system that will provide a more true reflection of how an in vivo tissue or organ will respond to a change within the microenvironment. Dr. Colley, is 21 days a general reference standard? No, it's actually, it, it, it's a quite interesting standard. So we also do drug transport studies on CACA2 cells in transport plates, which is a 2.5D system. And we leave these cells for 21 days. As the cells then present with a monolayer and, the, and they start to express some key proteins and, and enzymes as well as microvilli. It is, for, uh, it is as if these cells then at this point start to remember who they are, if that makes sense because they actually start to dif differentiate after this time. And this is uh, because of trypsinization. So Rzezinski um, and Faye in 2013, see the, you can see the list of, uh, rep, um, you can see the list of uh, publications at the end of this one, actually found that for cells and not just the CACA2s or the C3A cell line, uh, to completely recover from trypsinization and reconnect and establish cellular communication, they need around 18 to 21 days before they are fully recovered and communicating with each other. Have you, <clears throat> excuse me, have you studied the impact of theological properties of the materials on the cells? Um, no, that will actually be a quite interesting study to do, um, if, 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 like the sodium alginate. But usually sodium alginate is an inert um, substance, that is why it's, used. it's actually been used for quite a long time 
in as a, a biocompatible system. They used it initially, and um, Sun and Lin in 1982 published the article where they used islet cells that they encapsulated into sodium alginate and transplanted into humans. And for this reason, I decided on sodium alginate because it does not interfere that we know of with the with the spheroids or with your results, but it should be something that you, you can look at. It, it's something that I will add to my control groups just to make sure that we do not have interaction. Dr. Collins, you mentioned that you use sodium alginate. Why do you prefer this to prepare spheroids? Uh, this actually comes down to what I just said. So we look at our research question and we look at our available resources so this is why we chose this so when i i had a cell line that i wanted to produce words with using the agarol plates but our resources forced me to look for a not too expensive alternative method to do it so sodium alginate is a very affordable it's a natural hydrogel of a non-animal origin that is biocompatible it is um, transparent that makes cell imaging very easy and the gel itself is porous, allowing for diffusion of nutrients and waste. So it's very easy to work with, and as I said, it's inert, so you will, have to, there's, you will not have to worry that your alginate will interfere with your data, and alginate itself can be modified in their, uh, their oh, that's a difficult word, <laughs> according to your, to your needs. However, I would uh, suggest to use a well-characterized and highly purified alginate, because if you do not use this, then you will have instances where they do interfere with your, with your data. If there are no more questions, I would like to once thank you again, Dr. Khalid. Do you have any final comments for our audience? No, no, this was, this was quite fun. And if you have any questions for me, please feel free, feel free to reach out. I am on ResearchGate, LinkedIn, and, and on Instagram. We share some of our nice stories with me making the lab on Instagram. So, yes. Oh, and also look out for Selvi, though. <laughs> Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. We would like to thank again Dr. Carly Mikalitz for her time today and her important research. We would also like to thank Labert and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through November of 2018. Labberts will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>